Thank you for listening to The Brook Podcast. We are real people finding real hope in the real world. Learn more at thebrook.net. Amen. All right. Well, again, open your Bible in the book of Acts. We're going to be in Acts chapter 10. We've been in different episodes of the book of Acts. We're looking at these different stories, and mostly what we've been doing is we've been tracking along with the Apostle Peter, and that's what we're going to do today. The last half of the book of Acts really has to do with the Apostle Paul. But here's another experience of the Apostle Peter. Now, sociologists tell us that in the average lifetime, the average lifetime, you're going to interact with 80,000 different people. That is, if you live in a city or a suburb you're going to interact with 80,000 different people. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing to think about that many people actually. Now, out of that 80,000, 150 of them are people with whom you are acquaintances. Um, people that if you saw them, you'd recognize their face, maybe would even know those name, their names. Sociologists tell us that of those 150 people, the vast majority of those 150 people are people who are just like us people who have the same hopes in life, people who live in the same geographic region close by, people who have the same aspirations, maybe the same fears, the same values, the same interests that we have. And I bring that up because what we're looking at today is the fact that the gospel, the gospel is a message for all people. And so I want us to think a little bit about the relationships in our lives. And if it's true that this 150 people that we know are those who are just like us, then what about our lives being lived in some way to get up next to people who are different from us, who are not like us? And so the Apostle Peter has an experience here in Acts chapter 10 where he's going to learn a huge, huge lesson. He's going to learn that the gospel is indeed for all people. So let's set the context here. In the beginning of chapter 10, there's a man named Cornelius who is a Roman centurion, the Bible tells us. And Cornelius has a vision. He has a vision. And in that vision, an angel told him to send people, to send servants to a man named Peter who resided in the city of Joppa. And the next day, sure enough, that's what happens. He sends two people. The Bible tells us that Cornelius was a righteous man. It was a God-fearing man. So he sends servants to Joppa to find the apostle Peter. They arrive there at the house. And as they're going there on their way, the Bible tells us that Peter himself has a vision from God. And looking in verses 9 through 16, is contained this vision. Let's read it together. Here's what it's what happened. The next day, as they were on their journey, that is, those servants who were going from Cornelius' house, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. And he became hungry, and he wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance. And he saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I've never eaten anything that is common, could be translated unholy. So the word holy means separate and distinct, unique. So this word would be that which is unholy, that which is more common. He says, I've never eaten anything that is unholy or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time. Peter, what God has made clean, do not call unclean. This happened three times. And the thing was taken up at once to heaven, and thus the vision ended. Now immediately, what I think about here is the number three. And I think about how important the number three was in the Apostle Peter's life. (laughs) Peter was a three-time man, right? Three denials of Christ. Three times there in John 21 where Jesus restored him. Do you love me, Peter? Yes, feed my lambs, that kind of thing. Three times, and now three times he has this experience. Sometimes there are people who have to have things repeated to them. And Peter, I think, was one of them. And so this this vision of this sheet that appeared, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles on it. Rise, Peter, kill, eat. No, Lord, I will not eat anything, anything unclean. And the Lord says in response to Peter, do not call anything that I have made clean, unclean. Here's 
here's what's going on. You, you know this to be true, because if you understand some of the background of, of Jews in the first century, Peter's biases, Peter's prejudices, Peter's differences with other people lingered into his Christian life. And here he was now as a Christian, having the same kind of disposition that he had as a Jew that would say, I do not associate with anything outside of my Jewish faith. Now, who was Cornelius? Cornelius was a Roman. More specifically, the Bible tells us that he was Italian. And obviously, he was not a Jew. So let's, let's put our mind here in the first century. Let's understand the, the Jew-Gentile problem that's going on here because it has direct application to you and me. Whenever you see the word Gentile in the New Testament, the word Gentile is a word that's been transliterated from the original language. So what happened is that the original word in the Greek language in the New Testament is ethne, which can be translated nations, people, or people groups. Well, it's not really Gentile, it's ethne. But when it was translated from the Greek language into one of the earliest translations we even have different from the original language, and that is in Latin, the Latin word that was used for that word is the word gentilis, which eventually became kind of morphed into the English word that we use today, which is Gentile. Here's what it simply means. It means someone of another nation. It simply means someone who is not a Jew not a Jew. Now, this again applies to you and me. The ideal here is this, anyone who is different from us. Peter is saying, I shall not associate with anything that is unclean. And what is that? Anything that is different from us, from me, from our nation, from our Jewish people. We bring that into today's world. We understand that there are inherently natural things that separate people, things that seemingly create boundaries that necessarily should not. For example, socioeconomic status. We have wealthy people, middle class, working class, poor people. The house you live in, the car you drive, the, the area of town that you live in, all those things are kind of socioeconomic indicators that tend to separate people from one another. Language can separate people. Of course, foreign languages, but even within languages, there are different dialects and, and different kinds of accents you know, the one from Boston is totally different than one from southern Louisiana. It's a little hard for them to converse. It's a, it's a natural kind of barrier between people. Culture. There are national cultures that are a lot different from the American culture, of course. But beyond that, there are also family cultures, aren't they? Certain family have certain traditions, certain beliefs, certain ways of thinking, certain ways of doing things that can naturally kind of separate people. Race. Race, most often expressed with skin color, tends to separate people. But beyond these sociological kind of boundaries, let's think a little bit deeper. There are things that naturally pull us away from others. For example, challenges in life. And if somebody is going through challenges I don't have in my life, I tend to withdraw myself from people like that. There are people who have certain addictions, there are people who have challenges in raising their children, challenges in their marriage, challenges in work, challenges in managing money. And so if we don't have that particular challenge, it's hard for us to understand. And we don't have it, it's, it's hard for us to understand why they have it. And it takes us away from knowing them. Dreams, desires. Some people are pursuing different things than us. They have different priorities in life. These are things that separate people. So all these things that seemingly separate people result in some things that was experienced in the first century that's experienced for us today. Ignorance. We choose simply not to know or to learn about people who are different from us. Not to understand them. Indifference. We just don't care about people who are different from us. Isolation. We tend to stay with and relate with people who are like us, meaning that we tend to withdraw from those who are not. Here's the problem with all that. Christianity is an other-focused movement. We saw this when we started this whole thing in week one. We were looking at Acts chapter two, but beyond the birth of the church, what you see is in the very nature of who Christ is, in his incarnation, Jesus was other-focused. 
Jesus came from heaven to earth to people who were different from him. He came to us, for us, for our sake, on our turf, in order to be with us, in order to reach us. The very heart of Christ, the very inclination and disposition of God himself is that he comes our way for our sake. But then we saw when we looked at Acts chapter 2, with the birth of the church, the inception of the church, what happened? The Holy Spirit fell upon those believers there in Jerusalem immediately. The result was they were proclaiming the gospel to whom? To people of other nations and other languages. And the reason that word ethne is so important, and though it's translated in certain contexts, Gentile, in the original language, it's the exact same word that Jesus used in Matthew 28 in the Great Commission. When he said, go and make disciples of what? Of all nations, ta ethne, of all nations, of all people groups. And inherently, the call on the Great Commission was to go to people who are different from you. Go to them. And so, you know, this is inherent in the Christian faith, and I'm not for sure how we drift, how we get to the point where we lose this, this aspect of going and reaching. Jesus had already covered this. I thought this week about Jesus' teaching, and I'm wondering why Peter's having such a problem with it, because here he is, all the way in Acts chapter 10. I mean, there's been a dramatic changes in Peter's life, but this is still here, this residual that's left over. Jesus taught on this all the time, and I thought about this week the story of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10. This amazing story that Peter heard. If you remember the story, you remember that there was a young religious lawyer, an expert in the law of the Jews, who came to Jesus and he asked him a question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Life And Jesus responds to him and says, well, you know the law, what does it say? And the lawyer said to Jesus, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, bingo, you're right, you're correct. What you said is exactly right. Go and do this and you will live. But the dialogue didn't end because the lawyer had one more question. Here's what he asked Jesus. Luke tells us, but wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? <laughs> and who is my neighbor? And so what does Jesus do? He goes into this very elaborate story, story that's been called the story of the Good Samaritan, the parable of the Good Samaritan. And the story says that a man fell among robbers who beat him nearly to death and left him on the side of a road. And on separate occasions, first of all, a priest comes along. He sees the man there on the road, beaten and bloodied. The priest walks around the man and continues on his way without helping him. A few minutes later, a Levite comes, sees the man there in the road, walks around him, leaves him uncared for, and does not help him. But then... A Samaritan comes. A Samaritan comes. Who were Samaritans? Gentiles. People whom the Jews hated. And the reason that they hated the, this particular group of people more than others is because Samaritans were kind of half Jews. Samaritans, while under captivity, were Jews who married people of other nations. And so in many ways, they were considered betrayers of the Jewish faith, and they were hated by the Jews. And Jesus picks the Samaritan not to be the villain in the story, but instead to be the hero. Jesus knew what was going on in the hearts and minds of those in that day. He told the story because he knew how they viewed people different from them. And so he uses the most prominent people in the Jewish social structure. First of all, he talks about the priest. This is the guy that is at the top of the heap. He's the guy who has the most clout in the Jewish social structure. The priest comes, passes by, does nothing to help the man. Then he chooses the Levite in the story. The Levite is second from the top. He's the next most important. Those who are descendants of Levi. 
does nothing to help the man. But then a Samaritan again. The most unthinkable person is the one who actually helped. Now, translate this into today's world. Think about how how amazingly radical this kind of teaching was in that context. Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. If Jesus were in Jerusalem today, let's say in 2018, Jesus were teaching this story, and he was teaching it in the city of Jerusalem, he might tell the story of the good Palestinian. Or if he was in Palestine, he might tell the story, the parable of the good Israeli. Here in the United States, he might tell the story of the good Muslim. In Iraq or Iran, he might tell the story of the good American. He tells this story, and at the end of the story, he asks this lawyer, he says, who is it that proved to be this man's neighbor? And the lawyer said, the one who showed mercy. And Jesus said, go and do the same. Jesus knew what the lawyer's real question was. There's an underlying question that was so evident. Here's the lawyer's real question. Is there a non-neighbor option? (laughs) Is there anybody that would be included in the category of not being a neighbor? Was his real question. And Jesus' answer to that was a stark no. There's not. There's not anybody. What Jesus was teaching by this story, what Peter learned there in Acts chapter 10, are two things that are really, really important. The first thing is this. We don't get to choose whom to love. We don't. Not in Christ. Peter, you don't get to choose who to love. Not anymore. Now, the story in Acts chapter 10 continues on. Cornelius and Peter eventually meet up because Peter is brought to his home, Cornelius' home. Peter enters the house. Cornelius falls down at Peter's feet and almost begins to worship him in humility. Peter says to him, stand up. Peter says, I'm just a man. (laughs) Stand up. And then Peter goes on to tell the gospel message of Christ crucified and resurrected there to Cornelius and Cornelius is now informed about his faith. And the Bible tells us the Holy Spirit came upon those Gentiles who were there in Cornelius' house. Think back to the story of the Good Samaritan. The question, is there a non-neighbor option? The question, who do I have to love? You fill in that blank for you today. You think about that question for a moment. Do I have to love the street people? Do I have to love my in-laws? Do I have to love my difficult co-worker? Do I have to love the spouse who left me? Do I have to love the gay person? Do I have to love the liberal? Do I have to love the neighbor from another country who doesn't mow his lawn like I think he should? Can I just love people who are like me and people who love me in return? Isn't that what God expects? No. No. God expects much more than that. Notice the sin in the story of the Good Samaritan. The sin is not the sin of the robbers. It's not the sin of active violence against people. What is the sin in the story of the Good Samaritan? It is the sin of neglect. It is the sin of indifference. It is the sin of walking by people who are in need. You see, it's not enough just to tolerate people who are different from us. We are called to love them. It's not enough just to coexist. Look at the story. Think about the story. In the story, the man stopped, the Samaritan stopped, and he entered into the other's world. And that's what we're called to do. There's these mindsets that hurt the gospel. Mindsets, not of hatred, not mindsets of violence. I don't think there's anyone in here who's advocating the mistreatment of others who are different from us, but the mindset that is exactly like the mindset of the Jews of the first century was mindset, were mindsets of fear and isolation and a passive indif- indifference. 
a distant, kind of removed acceptance of people. It says, well, they don't bother me and I just won't bother them. We are called for more than that. We are called to build relationship with those who are different from us. And practical love means, just as in the story of the Good Samaritan, just as Peter was called to go to Cornelius, it means that we are to invite people different from us into our world. And better yet, as the Bible would explain, for us to enter theirs. For us to be willing to do for them what Jesus did for us who entered our world for our sake. And again, I don't, I don't understand how we've become so prim and proper and high and mighty and how we've missed this because it was all over the ministry of Jesus. And Jesus himself was called a friend of sinners. He, he hung out with people different from him so much that he was labeled as one of them. They meant it as a cut down. I think Jesus wore it as a badge of honor. And so we don't get to choose whom to love. Which goes to the second thing that's true from the story of the Good Samaritan and the story about Peter. Acts chapter 10 verse 28. Look at what happens when Peter enters Cornelius' house. Here's what it says. You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew. This is Peter talking to the household of Cornelius, by the way. (laughs) Peter said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit with anyone of another nation. There's that word again. But God has shown me that I should not call any person unholy or unclean. Now, I think it's a little bold of Peter, first of all, to walk into somebody's house and say, by the way, you're unholy and unclean, but God said, I'm supposed to love you. (laughs) Peter's just honest, right? But he he had learned his lesson. And here's what Peter learned. Others unlike us are really exactly like us. Now, I know we want to think that we're better. I know we want to think that, you know, we've got we've got something that we deserve. If you look at the scripture, we're going to see here that our need for salvation is what makes us common with other people. Look at what it says here in Romans 3. For there is no distinction. The Apostle Paul would say there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Every one of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Now, of course, we've received a gift of salvation. It is a gift that is precious. It's a gift of our own undeserved nature, and yet God has bestowed it upon it. But it's a gift that is to be shared with other people, and it's a gift to be remembered that we didn't have once. I remember what it's like to not have Christ in my life. I remember that. And I think we tend to forget And so we are one with others in our need for salvation. In Acts chapter 15, the Apostle Peter, again, later on, there's this big meeting that takes place in Jerusalem, at the Church of Jerusalem. It's a council, basically, that gets set up between the apostles and the elders. And they're deciding a big, big question about the church. Are the Gentiles going to be included in Christ? And thankfully, they decided, yes, the Gentiles would be included with faith in Christ. But here's what Peter says in that meeting. He says, God who knows the heart bore witness to them, that is the Gentiles, by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them. God made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. So we are one with others in our need for salvation, but also after having cleansed our hearts with faith, we are also one in the family of faith. Once people cross the line of faith, we are now a family. And though different, we are one because of Christ. Here's what Paul said. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Paul is saying these things that have naturally divided people are gone. I want to remind you 
The birth of the church meant the birth of a new community. Why are we here in this same room? It is because of Christ. That's why we're here. We are a new family. And so we have a way of identifying ourselves with one another that crosses lines that tend to separate. We are one in Christ Jesus. And that oneness includes everybody who at one time was different from us. It's one of the things that we celebrate reunion, when we have reunion. This particular reunion, this coming Wednesday night, we're going to have a month of missions focus, or we're just going to celebrate the nation, celebrate the family that God has called together under Christ Jesus. So because of our common need, and that once Christ is in us and we have accepted Christ as our Savior, we now share a common family. Because of those two things, we must be willing to go to those who are different from us. Go to those unlike us to get outside our normal routines and our normal relationships to see and be used by God. Most of you in this room can identify and recall someone who impacted you for the name of Christ. Someone who spoke to you. Someone who included you. Someone who invited you. Someone who shared with you. You, their story of faith. Someone who befriended you in some way and shared Christ. They made a difference in your life for Christ. And here's what I want to say. Every one of us has a person like that in our life. And what is true for us now is that every one of us have people in our lives with whom we can make that difference. You do. You just have to look. They're there. You just have to see. You just have to pray. You just have to be open. You have to be willing. You have to notice. In this sense, they are our neighbors. And we must prove to be a neighbor to them. We have the joy, the privilege, and the opportunity and the responsibility to make an eternal difference in their lives. Paul would say it like this. The Apostle Paul would say it. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Let that set. Can you say that? Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe, to first the Jew and then to the Greek. It's the power of God. It's what saved me. It's what saved you. It's what saved us. And it's a gift that we must share with other people. That's why we are challenging you this month. We come, we hear, do we leave changed? Are you taking to heart that to be a disciple means to make disciples? Do, do you, are you taking to heart the the fact that God wants to use you in, in building the kingdom of God to help other people find saving faith in Christ. He wants to use you in a small or a big way. He wants to use you. He wants to use me. So I'm going to say it again. I've said it for the last two weeks. Pray prayers about people in your world with whom you can first build a bridge. Build a bridge. Build a relational bridge with someone different from you. Share your story. Share the difference that Christ has made in your life. Invite to church. Build a bridge. Share your story. Invite to church. And we're going to give you a, just a huge opportunity, a huge tool by which to invite people to church. And that's next week. Next week, we have the Brook Block Party next Sunday. We're going to have inflatables for kids, families, food, lots of fun, lots of activity. It's going to be an opportunity for people to come and to hear about the love of God and to experience a loving church community. Why would we be ashamed of that? It would be a great way for you to reach out to someone in your world. May God use us 
to reach people different from us. And may our church reflect that in the kind of family that we share. Let's bow in prayer. So Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for recording for us the experiences of people like the Apostle Peter, of the story that Jesus told about the Samaritan. Thank you that they are compelling and that they teach us so much. And so God, I pray that you would help us this week, even this day, to see people around us. I pray, God, that you would specifically interrupt our routine this week, that there would be some divine moment or divine opportunity, Lord, that you just put in our path and that we would have, we would have the conscience to see that take place and recognize that it's from you and to respond with courage to it, to reach out to another individual. I'm praying that I would have the love, the compassion, the mercy to share with two people that are in my world, God. And I can invite them this week for each and every one of us, God, that you'd use us. There's great joy in this. And we thank you that you want to include us. And we pray that you give us not only the opportunity, but also the inner strength the power of the Holy Spirit by which to act and to do your will. Thank you for our dear church family. Thank you for their responsiveness, their love, the way that they are faithful and respond to you and your word. Bless them this week as they go out into their worlds. Give them eyes to see, ears to listen a heart to feel and then hands to act. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening to The Brook Podcast. We are real people finding real hope in the real world. Learn more at thebrook.net.